Um, I'm going to try to skim through the actual content and concentrate more on the sort of meta structure of the presentation so you get an idea of what, what yours um, could or should look like. Does that make sense? So like, so um, there's a bunch of slides in here that um, just label like what it is that is in this presentation, right? So like this is the very first slide. It has a title in having a digital environment. I came up with that title. It's not like, um, right? Um, wait, actually, I don't remember this, if this is the subtitle of her chapter. Um, but, um, but after reading that chapter, I had a bunch of thoughts that I wanted to talk about. Um, and so this isn't actually a summary of the chapter. It's, it's more of a um, commentary on, on the contents of the chapter, I guess, or um, on, on the things that I was thinking of after I read the chapter. And um, so when you do yours, it doesn't need to be a summary because all of us are gonna read it already anyways too. You should instead highlight what you think are important um, you know, and pay attention to that bullet list that I'm gonna send you. Um, and then just throw in other stuff uh, that you think that you think is interesting. Um, so this title slide, um, you know, it includes the topic. It includes my name, um, the date. Uh, so I'll change this to summer. Um, and uh, yours, <laughs> you know, should have your name on it and the date and stuff like that. It's kind of surprising that some students don't do that. Um, but you know, so that's what this is. If you are ever planning on going to grad school or do presentations at conferences or anything like that, then this title slide should also be the very last slide. Um, and the reason why is because uh, usually at a conference, you would also include um, your email address or contact info. And when you're done talking, you leave the slide up and people will see that and be able to email you and contact you outside of the outside of the conference or whatever. Um, but anyways, uh, there's a video. Oh, we're gonna skip this. You should watch this on your own because uh, I don't think we have time. Um, but there's a video that basically introduces the whole book. You can find this on YouTube or you can just uh, I'll just co copy it right now. You can um, you can uh, find this in the um, presentations folder of our Google folder. Um, okay, now you could follow along if you wanted to, because now there's a copy of that uh, presentation in our in our folder. Um, So, um, so yeah, there's that video. Uh, then the elements of a presentation, the things that I want you to have, that I want you to include, um, some sort of title, uh, right? Um, I want you to do a little bit of research on the author or authors of the thing that you're reading. Uh, Cause sometimes it's useful to figure out where they're coming from. Maybe they're like, really extreme um, one way or other um, in terms of political views or something like that. And so that would be useful to know, you know, to so always read everything with a grain of salt. Um, um, you know, give us some background on, on them. Like why should we trust them as a, as a valid source of information? Um, or if not the author, uh, then at least the publication. Um, so like we've got readings from the New York Times, from the Atlantic, from the Guardian, from a bunch of places that I think are pretty reputable. I tried not to pick just like some journal I've never heard before, um, but do a little bit of, you know, background research on these things. Um, we should always be skeptical of our sources and everything. Um, and then do a really quick intro of the topic or reading. Um, and again, you don't need to summarize the reading because all of us are going to read it anyways. Just give us enough information so that we know we have enough so that you can then do your presentation on whatever it is that you think you should be talking about, right? And then, um, and then actually 
make some sort of argument um, and help us step through it so that it makes sense. Um, and then at the very end, ask two questions and then uh, include references if you, if you included more stuff or if you found more stuff. Um, and one thing to just concentrate on other than this slide, like you should be trying to make your slides. Well, okay, so in normal quarters, you should be trying to make your slides uh, with as little text as possible. And uh, think of it as like a TED talk and um, be using the slides as visual aids um, for whatever it is that you're talking about. Um, if there's a chart or something like that, then obviously you need to show that. But, uh, but you don't need to write like paragraph, like a wall of text uh, on your slides that you're just gonna read to us. Like you should never do that. Um, instead, have the wall of text in your speaker notes. And if you have to read these, then you can read these, but, um, but have the slides be something interesting visually that sort of reinforce whatever it is that you're saying. Um, so a note on speaker notes, I want you all to use this liberally, like mandatorily liberally. Um, and so like, um, um, if, well, so it serves two purposes. One is uh, some people uh, retain information way better when they read it rather than when they hear it. Um, and uh, in general, people retain information better when they, when they get it from multiple sources um, or multiple mediums. And so being able to be there in the Zoom presentation where you're talking to us live, but then also being able to read it um, is just super useful. Um, it also makes it more accessible uh, in case, you know, we don't have anyone who has special accommodations um, but, um, you know, I've had before, like, a, um, a student who was hard of hearing. So, like, having the text written down is, like, super, super useful. Um, um, it also makes it easier for people who can't be here. So, like, if you can't make the Zoom meeting, uh, you sh again, you should watch the recording, but you can also open up these presentations on your own computer and just read the, read the text as well. Um, so I want I want all of us to do this. So basically, that's, so that's why I'm not actually doing the presentation because there's not enough time. But what I would be doing is basically not really reading this, but summarizing what all this stuff says or saying in a different way. I mean, I know what basically all, all the slides say. Um, so, and that's what I would suggest you do also is like, um, if you can, so the problem is you kind of need time to practice in order to do this, but um, so if you actually need to read this, then you can, but if you can, then you could write something down and then just know what each slide is going to be about. And then just tell us, um, when you're doing your live presentation and make sure whatever you tell us covers the same stuff as what you've written down, but doesn't have to be verbatim what you've written down. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so anyways, yeah, so, so this is Mary Chaco. Um, she's a professor at Rutgers. Um, and she's been studying like basically internet or not just internet, but like media culture for a long time. Um, and more recently internet stuff. Um, and wrote this book basically uh, a few years ago. It's kind of funny, like these textbooks about the internet, uh, like get outdated so fast. Like I feel like in a year or two, I need to replace this with another reading with another book because um, this one is already starting to feel a little long in the tooth. Um, um, but anyways, so this is about her. I found, you know, some interesting things about her. Usually when someone creates, a, when, when a, when a academic writes a book, they create a web page for the book. And that's what this is. I don't know if this is her current web page or her, her current homepage, but this is what it was, um, like two years ago when I, when I first created this presentation. Um, so my topic is what is the nature of reality? Um, and then what makes something real, which are two different things. Okay, so then this slide here is basically a header slide. It's like the, the start of a new section of my talk. And so I like to usually have a slide that acts as sort of like a, um, like a announcement of the section. 
type of thing. Um, just so like, as if you were writing a paper and you would do headings for your different sections of the paper, right? Do the same thing for your slides. It makes it, it makes them easier to, uh, to follow. Um, and actually what some people do, um, papers and slides that you would present at a conference and like a poster that you would create at a conference um, often go hand in hand and follow the same sort of uh, structure and you can bounce back and forth between them. Um, so like I could write a paper based off of these slides now, um, but you could also, you know, create slides based off of paper, use the same sort of headings, right? Um, okay, so there's some terms that she covers, social, mental, and techno-social. The, the chapter covers social mental, um, which is basically like we just break down the word. Um, social is just like uh, uh, relationship type of stuff, like inter interpersonal, like how we relate to each other or uh, relate to things. Um, and then uh, mental is like, uh, you know, stuff that goes on in our heads. So um, this term social mental uh, is uh, basically used to describe how we interpret the world or how we interact with the world, I guess, or, or how we participate um, in that uh, we're interrelated with a bunch of other people um, and other objects, I would argue, uh, other things, um, and how we interpret those relationships is what sort of determines um, the reality that, that we're experiencing, I guess. Um, and then, but her book actually talks about techno-social, which is a, a slightly different term um, and isn't actually covered that much in the chapter. Um, but uh, techno-social is um, um, actually, if you look at academic literature, sometimes the two words are switched to reverse social technical. Um, um, or another word for it is social material. Um, and it basically is this idea that um, like, uh, I guess it's the interpersonal part of it that's expanded to include um, material objects. So the things that we have relationships with aren't just people, it's also all the stuff that we have around us. Um, so all this tech that we have around us, this desk, you know, this video camera that I'm using, I have a relationship with it. Um, it's mediating how I have a relationship with you. And so it's part of the equation, you know. And sometimes um, um, if none of you were there and I was just sitting here in front of the camera recording this and then, and then uploading it to YouTube, whatever, and asking you to watch it, then like my relationship with the video camera would be different, I feel like, than, um, than what is, what's going on right now, you know? So all these different things um, sort of interplay into um, what it is that we're experiencing and everything. Um, um, Oops. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, if you're interested in the stuff, if you're interested in this chapter or um, or the book in general, there's a whole bunch of other things that you could get into. Um, this thing called distributed cognition, actor network theory, all these different things. Bogos is the same Ian Bogos that we're going to be reading later on in the, in the quarter. He calls these things object-oriented ontology, like the way we think about how the world works. Um, is an ontological um, theory, I guess. And um, um, this way of thinking about the world in terms of social technical, or as in like this, the, the objects we have around us and our relationship to those objects is an object oriented way. Um, using the same sort of word as, a, as a, like if you're familiar with programming, object, object oriented programming, different objects have different uh, functions and different attributes. Um, and they're all interrelated. Um, um, and then it doesn't matter if they're human or non-human. Um, but anyways, uh, so, you know, one thing to note from just from the slide is how I do this. Uh, I didn't write a sentence. I didn't write techno-social is the material and relational, you know, whatever, blah, 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 right? Instead I use uh, equals and plus. Um, Basically what you want to do is minimize however many words you have on your slides as possible. And um, math equations are a great way of doing that. Um, so that when you are when you as a reader are reading this, you know, you go social mental equals interpersonal and cognitive, right? Like you parse out what those symbols mean. And so that's good. Um, 
and you know you should have shortcuts like that in your slides. Um, this is more important if you do like a live presentation or obviously when we were if this course was actually happening live like we were in a meeting in a classroom then this would be more important but now that we're all at our computers it actually sort of doesn't matter how much text is on each slide anymore because now each of us is sort of digesting them individually on our own computers um, but um, this is just general good to know so there's a subheading um, um, talk about society and culture a little bit. You can just read the speaker notes, whatever, but basically it's like a collective version of, of that um, social material world. Um, we have to agree, like different, like as a, as a group of people, they have to agree um, on what counts for them to be considered to be within the same culture or the same society. Um, and if they don't have that agreement, then I would argue that they're in they're in different subcultures. Um, this makes it really interesting because <laughs> uh, we have America, but we have a bunch of subcultures in America, right? Um, we've got Trump supporters and Trump haters, and it seems like they will never ever be able to be friends again. Um, and it's not like they're not all people, but they're, they have a different shared reality. Um, they believe in different things. They, they, um, um, yeah, anyways, so as an example, so, um, there's some things in the book that she covers that are interesting or useful to know for the rest of the quarter when we get into it, but I, uh, I'm just going to skip over it right now, but like co-presence, um, just remember that when we get to the, um, Cohen and, and Cohen article, the one about whether social media is a bad thing or whether spending time on Facebook on our phones is a bad thing. Just remember this uh, co-presence word uh, for that. Um, okay, so the nature of reality is like, um, uh, what counts as reality, I guess, is uh, our relationship to other people and stuff and how we interpret those relationships, right? From there, we can actually answer then what is real, which is a different question than what is reality. Does that make sense? So what is real is gonna be different for each person because their interpretations are gonna be different about the relationships that they have, the relationships that they have with people and things are gonna be different than somebody else's relationships with people and things. They're gonna be a different set of people and things um, and a different interpretation of even the same people and things. Does that make sense? So each individual then has a different real. Yeah? Okay, so this is, this is why it's impossible to argue with some people who are so adamant in their beliefs. It is real for them. Um, so, <laughs> so anyways, yeah, so like there's Neo shaking, uh, like scratching his head, right? What the hell's going on? Um, but, um, Okay, so to help us with that, uh, maybe this uh, quote from uh, these two researchers called Thomas and Thomas, um, you know, they were married. I don't know their first names. They're both named Thomas. Uh, if people define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. Um, so that's actually what matters. So like, it really doesn't matter if um, your real is the same as my real or whether I count your real as actually real. What actually matters is your behavior and your uh, responses and feelings and emotion based off of your real, real, right? And I should take that in consideration because I want to treat you as a human. And if I believe something to be real, my behavior is gonna reflect that belief um, and the consequences of that behavior and my interpretation of what that real is um, are real. 
have have an effect. Um, and so this is one way of thinking about bullying. This isn't that controversial anymore, but 10 years ago, or even five years ago, or I mean, it's still a little bit today, there are people who consider online bullying not that big a deal um, because it's online, um, you know, and like, uh, you know, you could just turn it off or you could just ignore it or you could just not treat it as real because it's not real, you know, it's just this online thing. But that's bullshit because it actually is real for a lot of people, um, you know, uh, people who spend their lives online you know, where they, where they hang out with their friends online, where they, their whole social life is online, that definitely is real for them. And if you, if you get bullied in that setting um, and you feel real emotional pain from it, um, that you can't say that that's not real. Um, and so the consequences of believing, of, of sort of treating that space as real, uh, the consequences of, of doing that, are also real. <laughs> and so like, we just need to keep those in mind. Um, and so that's, you know, one way of sort of thinking about all these like social media effects and everything is spending time on Facebook bad. Well, it really depends on the person. Um, but anyways, um, so this cognitive reality is reality then, right? Um, and actually, so one thing that I should also mention and is more and more true every year is, um, there's this question sort of like from, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, which is like, um, is online life as real as face-to-face -face life? And um, right now you should be thinking, no, I mean, uh, that's bullshit because like, I mean, it's a bullshit question because basically uh, I just said that um, they're real because of the consequences and everything and interpretations. But, um, but it's almost like a bullshit question because uh, because we actually don't live online or offline anymore. We live blended. Um, like every one of us probably, uh, this, ha that hasn't, this actually hasn't been true for one quarter that I taught at UWB, but this statement, every one of us has a smartphone. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry if you're that one student who doesn't have a smartphone, but, um, um, that means that your existence in life is blended. It's partially online, it's partially offline. Uh, it's really hard to extricate the two um, because it's really easy to entangle them, um, you know? And so, and so the question of online versus offline is, is actually kind of a moot question. It's, it's, a, it's a false dichotomy now and, and more and more true. Um, you know, as we, you know, we're going to have like uh, contact lenses with HUDs on them, you know, in like 10 years and stuff like that, right? So like all this is going to be bullshit. Um, so my questions. Uh, many people report feeling solitary online. What does Chaco say about that? What conditions do you think contribute to either feeling alone or not? And if there is no distinction between online or offline life, at least in, you know, how people attach meaning to them, how does that change how we should talk about online bullying, trolling, which I already sort of talked about, addiction, censorship, etc.? Uh, should they be treated the same as offline things or differently? So these two questions are going to be posted to Slack. Um, and uh, um, you'll have to, until Monday to answer them. Any questions? Um, real quick question. So yeah. we, we answer to both Slack and to uh, Canvas or just to Slack? Every week you're going to be doing both Canvas and Slack. Um, things, activity. One of them is in Slack, you're gonna be answering questions from the presentations after their presentations are over. And in Canvas, you're gonna be answering questions in Canvas before presentations happen. Oh, okay, okay. The questions on Canvas are purely factual. Like they're just like, what is, you know, X? And you just say, it's blah, 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 because this person said so on page three or whatever, you know? They're just for me to make sure you did the readings. The, the questions, the discussion that we have on Slack are meant to be actually a discussion and, and we actually talk about these things in, in some real way or some uh, deeper way. Got it. Um, any other questions? It's 4.30. <laughs>
uh, oh, so like the very end, you know, I've got references for stuff. Um, and then one thing that's for super useful for books, especially if you're reading a book, um, find somebody's review of it. Uh, um, sometimes reading book reviews are, are really good to give you insight into, into um, you know, some things that the book covered. <laughs>